we do not follow suspicious things. We don't look in the suitcase. We don't check out the mannequin on the side of the road. We just call the police. Hey y'all, welcome and or welcome back to my channel. My name is Janae, if you didn't know, and today's video is day two of Halloween. So if you're ready, let's go. All right, y'all. So today we're going to be talking about Lisa Ann French, who was born on June 2nd, 1964 in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, to her parents, Marianne Garrick and Alan French. Unfortunately, Marianne and Alan's relationship didn't last and they decided to go their separate ways. And once they did this, Marianne and Lisa moved from Oshkosh to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And Fond du Lac is only about a 30 minute drive approximately from Oshkosh. And at some point, Marianne will meet a man named Bruce DePau and the two of them will move in together. And I don't know if Marianne met Bruce before she moved to Fond du Lac or if she met Bruce and then they moved together. I don't know. But nonetheless, the two of them found a place together. And by 1973, little Lisa was now nine years old and she had a newborn baby brother. And at the time, Lisa is a fourth grader at Shegwick Elementary School. And she was also a member of the Girl Scouts. I love Girl Scout cookies. What's y'all favorite Girl Scout cookie? Mine is the little caramel and chocolate joints with the coconut. Like, ooh, ooh, that just, mm. Anyway, y'all, so it's October of 1973 and Lisa is getting excited about Halloween and going trick-or-treating because this particular year, Lisa had plans. Her and her little friend Ann, Ann Parker, they had plans to go trick-or-treating together and they was gonna do this while they was on their way to, uh, I think it was like a town party that was being held outside. All of the town was gonna come. You know, it was gonna be fun, exciting. All the little kids gonna have activities to do, stuff like that. And so yeah, this was the plan for Lisa and Anne. And I know that sound kind of crazy for nine-year-olds to be going trick-or-treating by themselves and going to a Halloween party, but y'all gotta remember, this is 1973 in small town America, okay? This is a place where pretty much everybody know everybody, and this is a time when people didn't get mad at other people for scolding their kids. So if somebody saw Lisa and Anne doing something that they wasn't supposed to do, they would feel more than free to be like, hey, little girl, what is you doing? Don't be doing that. You know your mama wouldn't want you to do that. It was like all eyes on deck. You know, it was that kind of vibe. So nine-year-olds going out by themselves, it's not like they was being unsupervised, for real, for real. Anyways, y'all, so Halloween rolls around and Lisa is ready to go. She got on her little hobo outfit, because that's what she was going as for Halloween. She had on her little, her little blue jeans with the masking tape over them to make them look distressed, or not distressed, but to make them look patchy. And she had on her little black hat with the little stick over her shoulder with the bandana tied around it. Y'all know, this 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 kind of thing. And she was all ready to go. And so she headed out of the house at around 5.45 that evening. Now, like I said, initially the plan was for her and Anne to do this together. They was gonna go house to house trick or treating until they made it to the Halloween party. However, Anne had did something. She had did something to get in trouble and she was grounded. So her mom told her that she was not able to go trick or treating or to the Halloween party. And so Lisa had two options. She could either go home and stay in the house and not trick or treat because Anne couldn't go or she could do this alone. She could do this by herself and trick or treat, go to the Halloween party, come back home, no big deal. And so she chose the latter of the two. She decided that she was all right being a lone wolf and she started her trick or treating journey to the party. And she ended up stopping at the house of her teacher. She stopped at the house of another classmate and another neighbor, seemingly headed in the direction of the town party. And Lisa was a pretty responsible child and she knew that her curfew was 7 o'clock p.m. She was supposed to be in that house by 7 o'clock. But when Lisa's curfew came and went with no sign of Lisa, her mother Mary Ann kind of started to become a little bit worried, but not too much in the beginning because she was like, okay, you know, it's Halloween. She probably out still having a good time with her friends. Let me not panic too bad because generally she is a responsible child. She will be inside by her curfew, but maybe she lost track of time. Let me just give it a little bit. But when 10 o'clock rolled around and Lisa was not in the house, Marianne started to panic and she gathered up all of her neighbors. She gathered up all the townspeople that she could and they started a search party for little Lisa because this was very uncharacteristic of her. But the first night came and went of people searching for Lisa with no luck. And then another day and another day. The search for little Lisa went on for four days all across the county with thousands of people showing up to, to help Marianne find her daughter. And then on November 3rd, 1973, a farmer named Gerald Braun was riding home on his tractor in Taichita, Wisconsin at around 11.30 a.m. when he noticed two brown plastic bags 
kind of on the opposite side of a barbed wire fence and he decided to go see what was up. I don't know why. I'm glad he did, but again, we do not follow suspicious things. We don't look in the suitcase. We don't check out the mannequin on the side of the road. We just call the police. But nonetheless, he did end up going to see what was up with these two plastic bags. And unfortunately, when he opened the first bag, he found the nude remains of a small child. And in the second bag, he found clothing that appeared to be a Halloween costume. And as you can imagine, yes, these were indeed the remains of little Lisa Ann French. And so he obviously called the police and they came to do an investigation. And when Lisa's body was sent to the coroner's office, it was determined that her cause of death was asphyxia and circulatory shock brought on by SA. Lisa was laid to rest on November 6, 1973 at Emmanuel Trinity Lutheran Church in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. But yeah, so obviously an investigation started as soon as Lisa was found and they had a suspect in mind right away. However, it would take another nine months and a confession before Lisa's killer was brought to justice. And this happened on August 8th, 1974, when Gerald Miles Turner Jr. confessed to being the perpetrator of this crime. Now, this came after months and months and months of interrogations and prodding from the police department. Over the past nine months, Gerald had been bought in multiple times by the Fond du Lac Police Department. And each time they would question him extensively. And each time he would deny, deny, deny. Another time that he was bought in for questioning, he actually agreed to do a polygraph test. But the results of this polygraph test came back inconclusive. So they couldn't say that he committed the crime, but they couldn't say that he didn't commit the crime either. But they were still convinced that Gerald was their guy. And so finally, during one of the interrogations, they collected body hair from him and sent it off for testing. And when the body hair came back, it came back positive to body hairs that were found not only on Lisa's costume, but on Lisa herself. And once the results of this hair testing came back, Gerald decided to confess. And I'm not gonna go into graphic, graphic detail, but I'm gonna tell y'all what Gerald said happened. So basically Gerald said that Lisa came to his door and you know she did the regular trick-or-treat and he ended up sparking up a conversation with her about candy. Now mind you Lisa knew Gerald because the two of them had been next door neighbors. I don't know if y'all have these where y'all at but they have side-by-side -side apart it's not apartments what they call they houses but it's one on this side and one on this side and they literally share a porch and Lisa's family and Gerald they lived in this side-by-side -side duplex type of situation at one point and so she was familiar with him and so when he started talking to her about candy she wasn't uncomfortable with him she didn't think it was weird at all and so at some point during the conversation Gerald lures Lisa into the home and eventually into his bedroom where he proceeds to essay her and he said that after the essay she was no longer breathing and that he tried to resuscitate her but his retus but his resuscitation efforts was cut short because his girlfriend and his little baby his new infant child came home from the party that Lisa was supposed to be attending his girlfriend whose name was Arlene had taken their infant child to the Halloween party that Lisa was supposed to be attending Anyways, so she comes home at around seven o'clock. So he got to stop what he's doing. He throws on a robe and tells Arlene that he is sick. He just, uh, he just don't feel good at all. And during the time where Arlene and baby are at the house, he keep going back and forth into the room. And he said that at the time, Lisa wasn't in the main bedroom, that she was in a bedroom adjacent. So if Arlene had happened to come into the bedroom, she wouldn't have seen anything. But Arlene and the baby ended up leaving at around 8 o'clock to go visit with her mom. And once Arlene and the baby left, this is when Gerald put Lisa and her clothes into those two separate bags and then took her to Tai Chi to where she was later found. And on February 4th, 1975, Gerald was convicted of second degree murder along with two other charges and was sentenced to 38 years and six months in prison. However, on October 13th, 1992, he was actually released for good behavior. And as you can imagine, Lisa's family was not happy about this. And not only was Lisa's family not happy about this, but pretty much statewide outrage ensued because he, why is he out? 
But it wouldn't be long before he was back in jail because he was rearrested on November 23rd of 1993. And this was pretty much because the Department of Justice pretty much said, oops, my bad, we didn't mean to let you out that early. You wasn't supposed to be eligible for good behavior release. And so get your ass back in jail. And that's where he remained until January 29th of 1998 when he was released on parole. But he would violate his parole and would be sent back to jail in 2003. And for violating this parole, he was sentenced to 15 and a half years and he had a schedule release date of February 1st 2018 and this release would be without any parole restrictions so he would just be a free man he wouldn't have to answer to the Department of Justice he would literally just be a free sexual predator roaming the streets and Marianne knew what the terms of Gerald's release would be and she was not having it she did not want this man out on the streets at all and so she created an online petition to at least say that if this man is gonna get released please put him in a mental health facility because he should not be freely roaming the streets. And the petition that Marianne created got over 34,000 signatures. And because of this, Gerald's release was postponed and he did not get out on February 1st, 2018. And so he will remain in jail until some type of ruling was set. And then on February 23rd, 2022, Judge Paul Sisney denied Gerald's release and pretty much condemned him to a high security mental health facility for the rest of his life. And so that is where Gerald will remain until he dies, which I'm not sure if he died yet or not. I don't know but he's in a mental health care facility and that's where he will remain throughout the rest of his life and he will never be able to do this to another child because why would y'all let him out in the first place but yeah y'all that concludes day two of Halloween week thank you all so so very much for watching don't forget to like comment and subscribe and i will see you all in the next one <laughs> i think i over highlighted my forehead y'all huh. Oh, come on. This is going this is a trend in my videos at this point. To her parents, Marianne Ginich. What is it? And once they did this, Marianne and Alan no. I don't got no automatic ice maker, so what is that noise? Oh, I do got an automatic ice maker. But it ain't on though. And she also and she's also a particular Why the fuck are you like this? Why do you have a husband? Oh, it's my anniversary! Now, Lauren, oh, girl, where you get Lauren from? Nobody knows. Anyways, a farmer named Gerald Braun was, what was he doing? A farmer named Gerald Braun was riding his tractor home. <laughs> I don't know why that sounds so funny, you riding a tractor home, but I mean, I, I know I'm from Wisconsin, but baby, we don't live on no farms where I'm from. Not me actually gut laughing at myself. That's crazy. <laughs> hmm. Anyway. And so Gerald's release was pop. Bleh, pop what the fuck is that? 